Well, hello everyone, and welcome once again to Vlogatos. I'm Phil Ramsey, and in this Bible Truth series, we go through the Word together, chapter and verse. And you know, I really do consider it that we are going through it together. You know, uh, even even if you know, I don't know, maybe maybe these videos are still up years after, and someone someone maybe you're watching it five years after um, the video is done. But you know, uh, there's no distance in the spirit, and and I believe that anybody who's going through here with with me is really going through here with me you know we are we are all together we're united in the same spirit if you've said out loud that jesus is your lord and you believe in your heart god's risen him from the dead then you are my brother or sister in christ and therefore we have the same spirit we're of the same spirit and so we're going through this together whether you're watching this uh you know with me when it was first released or when you're when you're watching it um where you are now at the time that you're now in and god's word is still active and alive and powerful toward you uh, and so you have the benefit, um, same benefit that all of us have together as we go through here. And so I thank you that you uh, take the time to to go through these with me. I mean, it's a lot. You know, we do this uh, Monday through Friday. And so it's a lot of content, probably at least five times as much as most people who do uh, a vlog or a podcast because um, some, I mean, people might do it once a week or once a month. But, you know, partly the reason that we do this so often is and one, the first reason is that it is an example that it's possible to set aside just a short time with the God each day. I mean, half an hour, 45 minutes with God each day uh, will change a person's life uh, and the faithfulness to do it every day, not just once in a while. And, and uh, that's, that's really what it is, is that daily bread. It's our daily bread. You know, Jesus said, he was talking to God, he said, give us this day our daily bread. And, but Jesus also said, Man shall not live by bread alone, alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so he's quoting the word. So there is uh, a spiritual nourishment, a daily ration, if you will, of the word of God, our daily bread that we spend uh, uh, in God's word. And so when we do this on Vlogatos, we're doing this together. We're, share, we're sharing bread. We're breaking bread together, really. And so it's an awesome time. Um, you know, uh, and we ask that God blesses this time that we have together, uh, whether you're near or far, um, you know, now or then, you know, it is a time with God and, uh, with each other because we are united in God's spirit. And so I thank you for the commitment of the time, uh, that it takes for you to do this, because I know, uh, that it, you have to carve out a portion of your day if you're going to, if you're going to uh, tune into vlog toss every day. And so, uh, that is a great deal of faithfulness, and I am very appreciative. And so, um, we're in Second Chronicles, and we're in. We're, I'm going to go ahead and look at chapter thirty and thirty-one. Now, if you look at your green bookmark that we're in uh, for the second reading, it will indicate that <clears throat> normally when you finish um, uh, chapter thirty, you would go to Isaiah forty-four, and when you finish chapter thirty-one, you would go to Isaiah forty-nine. But we've already go gone through Isaiah, um, and so I think it's more helpful in this time feels right in my heart to just do chapter 30 and 31 and uh, if you want to go to those chapters you certainly can you can go to them on your own you can read through them or you can uh, click into the Isaiah playlist and look up the episode that contains uh, chapter 44 and the episode that contains chapter 49 and um, that will be most beneficial to you so let's go ahead and pray father I thank you for these things I thank you for uh, these things that you have placed before us in the word things of importance uh, things that you have placed value upon that you want us to pay attention to and adhere to and uh, be faithful in, not for the purpose of being faithful in those things just in and of themselves, but to be faithful in the things that please you for the purpose of pleasing you, for the purpose of drawing near to you. Um, I thank you for these things. I thank you, Lord, that, um, you know, things that we do for you in our, in, in, in our, our daily lives if we're doing them for you, truly, those things are strengthening our relationship with you. It, that's why the word says, uh, everything that you do, do as unto the Lord. Do it as as uh, though it's a direct offering to you. Uh, um, you know, and so that the, in that, then, the things that we do contain value. Outside of that, they're just things. So I thank you for insight into these spiritual matters. I thank you that uh, we can... Uh, take advantage of them in order to draw closer to you. And in Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Okay, so Second uh, Chronicles 30. So we're still with King Hezekiah. He's a good king. We're going to continue to see his faithfulness here. 
So uh, verse 1 says, King Hezekiah now sent word to all Israel and Judah. So so in the previous episode we saw he he first drew in the spiritual leaders, the priests and the Levites, and said, you need to purify yourselves, and then we're going to purify the temple. And then after that was done, then he called in the civic leaders and the people of the city. And now he's sending, he's extending that out to another layer, an outer layer, and saying, now we're going to send word to all Israel and Judah. So it's not just the southern kingdom that he is going to send word to, but also now the northern kingdom. Okay, this is something that no king before him has really done. Okay, so... Okay, so he says, uh, so it says he asked everyone, okay, sorry, I'll, I'll just, so King Hezekiah now sent word to all Israel and Judah, and he wrote letters of invitation to the people of Ephraim and Manasseh. He asked everyone to come to the temple of the Lord at Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover of the Lord, the God of Israel. Why? Because Passover was the first uh, festival that God gave the people before he brought them out of, out of Egypt. And so that was what he gave them before he even gave them his, the fullness of his word and established his covenant with them because it was only through Passover that they could even have covenant with him. And so Jesus is our Passover lamb. He is the gate. He is the entry point into relationship with the Father. Jesus said, no man comes to the Father but through me. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. And so now he, so, so Hezekiah is, uh, just doing an uh, amazing evangelistic work and calling to come back to God, come back, come and celebrate the Passover with us. Awesome. Okay, so uh, celebrate uh, the Passover of the Lord, the God of Israel. Verse 2, the king, his officials, and all the community of Jerusalem decided to celebrate Passover a month later than usual. They were unable to celebrate it at the prescribed time because not enough priests could be purified by then, and the people had not yet assembled at Jerusalem. This plan for keeping the Passover seemed right to the king and to all the people. So what they're doing is it's like, well, we're not, we're not, we see a need to come back to God, but we can't do it at the prescribed time that he originally gave us because not everybody's ready. So he, so they're like, we will follow the secondary plan that God gave us and do it the next month. And so this plan seemed right to the king, the people. So verse five, so they sent a proclamation throughout all Israel from Beersheba in the south to Dan in the north inviting everyone to come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover of the Lord, the God of Israel. The people had not been celebrating it in great numbers as required in the law, so they had been some people that were loyal to God had been doing it privately, personally, in their own home, but it had not been done on a national level in a long time. Verse 6, At the king's command, runners were sent throughout Israel and Judah. They carried letters that said, O people of Israel, return to the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, so that he will return to the few of us who have survived the conquest of the Assyrian kings. Do not be like your ancestors and relatives who abandoned the Lord, the God of their ancestors, and became an object of derision, as you yourselves can see. Do not be stubborn as they were, but submit yourselves to the Lord. Come to his temple, which he, he has set apart as holy forever. Worship the Lord your God, so that his fierce anger will turn away from you. For if you return to the Lord, your relatives and your children will be treated mercifully by their captors, and they will be able to return to this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful. If you return to him, he will not continue to turn his face from you. The runners went from town to town throughout Ephraim and Manasseh and as far as the territory of Zebulun, but most of the people just laughed at the runners and made fun of them. However, some people from Asher, Manasseh, and Zebulun humbled themselves and went to Jerusalem. So yeah, even if the majority don't listen to the message about Jesus, so now I'm talking about here in our time, because, you know, if you look at the statistics, the majority of Christians in America have never shared their faith with, with other people. And um, speaking as, as one who has been one of those in the past, the reason is, is that the fear of rejection, the fear of being mocked and ridiculed, because there's no open persecution in this nation, you know, at least not uh, in very great measures at this time, you know, where, you know, you can be, you know, legally punished and things like that, persecuted for your faith. I mean, the persecution goes as far as being made fun of, just like these people experienced here. But even if the majority does that, there's still always going to be some who do listen and some who do humble themselves and come to Jesus as their Lord. And so that's really what matters. It's for, it's for the benefit of those, you know, it, it's, it's, it makes it worth it for the few who do answer. You know, and yeah, there's times of re revival where a majority will answer. And I believe we're coming into a time like that soon. 
Um, but in the meantime, the Bible says be ready in season and out of season, you know, and so uh, share your faith with those around you. Um, trust God to uh, to be to uh, to make your words effective, you know, because even if a person doesn't accept right away, that doesn't mean that that seed that was planted won't benefit them at some later time. And maybe they'll come as a result of hearing it again and again, not just from you, but from others. And so there's a continual uh, sowing of seed. And uh, the Bible says God's word won't return to him void, but it'll accomplish that which he sent it forth to do. And so they'll either do like some of the wicked kings we saw in the past and just completely harden their heart towards God as a result of that word, or they'll humble themselves and turn to God and repent and be saved. And that's, uh, that makes it all worth it. You know, so moving on down. So verse 12, at the same time, God's hand was on, on the people in the land of Judah, giving them all one heart to obey the orders of the king and his officials who were following the word of the Lord. See, when you obey God, when you begin to obey God, he will make it easier to continue in that obedience. Um, you know, and that's that's a good place to be in. Verse 13, so a huge crowd assembled at Jerusalem in mid-spring to celebrate the festival of unleavened bread. They set to work and removed the pagan altars from Jerusalem. They took away all the incense altars and threw them into the Kidron Valley. The Kidron Valley was the place they burned all that junk. Now, so they've already purified the temple. They pulled all the stuff out of there. And so they start with that inmost layer. But now they're purifying the city, the whole city of Jerusalem. And because it said that that previous king had filled every corner of Jerusalem with these evil things with with idols and things like that and now they're purifying that so they start with that innermost layer purifying the temple and then moving out into the rest of the city and now they're throwing all the people are throwing all that junk out it was the priests and levites who cleared cleansed the temple but now the people are cleansing the city this is awesome so verse 15 on the 14th day of the second month one month later than usual the people slaughtered the passover lamb this shamed the priests and Levites, so they purified themselves and brought burnt, brought burnt offerings to the temple of the Lord. Then they took their places at the temple as prescribed in the law of Moses, the man of God. The Levites brought the sacrificial blood to the priests, who then sprinkled it on the altar. And so we may look at this from the negative side of, of shame and sorrow and say, well, this shamed them because they weren't ready, and so they had to, to do this a month later than normal. But God had given a, a way for that to happen. Even back with Moses when they celebrated the first Passover, he said if someone, because they're ceremony, ceremonially unclean or for some other reason can't celebrate, or maybe they're traveling, they can't celebrate the Passover at the prescribed time, let them celebrate it uh, on the next, in the next month. And so there is that um, symbolic second chance, if you will, and a second chance to do the right thing. You know, and so it's, we're not talking about, um, you know, the on the other side of a covenant, you know, being out of covenant with God. We're talking about people who are in covenant with God, realize that they've made a mistake and they have that second chance. Those first John one nine where it says, uh, you know, or where John was talking to the people. If you read first John chapter one, you'll see he said he's talking to the church. He said, I'm writing these things so that you don't sin. But if you do sin, he's like, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins if we confess our sins to him. And he's faithful to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And so there's that second chance, if you will. And God is a God of many second chances. And so as long as the people, their heart is right, God will, will help them. You know, he will extend the help, you know. And so sometimes it's like someone doesn't know exactly the right thing to do, but they're trying. And if they're trying with the motive of pleasing God or of getting to God or, 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 you know, finding their way back to God, even if they don't know everything to do and they're, they're trying, at least they're trying in the right direction and God will help them as they try that because they, he, he wants people to succeed. He wants people uh, to, to be successful and he wants people to be saved. So he says here, it says, uh, Verse 17, since many of the people had not purified themselves, the Levites had to slaughter their Passover lamb for them to set them apart for the Lord. Most of those who came from Ephraim, Manasseh, Issachar, and Zebulun had not purified themselves. Why? Because they were people in the north who had not uh, been living for God. And and they're just out there. They're, um, they've seen bad things happen. You know, the people have been carried away from by the Assyrians. The northern kingdom is in ruins. The southern kingdom is in trouble. 
And it's like they're just trying to live. They're just trying to pick up the pieces of their shattered lives. And then all of a sudden, one day, they get this message from these runners from the king in the southern kingdom. And they're like, turn back to God. This is why all this stuff has happened. because you turned away from God. And most of them mock and ridicule. But some of them hear the message and say, yeah, I need to get right with God. And so they travel the long distance to the southern kingdom to celebrate the Passover, but they're not, they, they, they've not been doing everything that's right. They, they, they haven't purified themselves, and so the Levites have to help them. And so God, but God is gracious. You see, he provides people to come and help us at times that we need help. And so uh, it says, verse 18 again, Most of those who came from Ephraim, Manasseh, Issachar, and Zebulun had not purified themselves, but King Hezekiah prayed for them, and they were allowed to eat the Passover meal anyway even though this was contrary to the requirements of the law. For Hezekiah said, May the Lord, who is good, pardon those who decide to follow the Lord, the God of their ancestors, even though they are not properly cleansed for the ceremony. And the Lord listened to Hezekiah's prayer and healed the people. And, and so are they, are, have they been stricken with something because they weren't purified? No, 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 no. We're talking about uh, infirmities, sicknesses, maladies that they had on them before they even came. Because God had said, told the people, if you turn away from me, sicknesses and stuff like that are going to come upon you. And they had. They had, but they're coming back to repent now. And so the sicknesses and diseases and stuff that was on them, after they, after, uh, they take the Passover meal, they're healed. It's a supernatural healing. How do we know that? Because the Bible says that after the people took the first Passover, before they came out of Egypt, it says when they came out of Egypt, there was not a, a sick or feeble person among them. Why? Because God extended healing as a part of the covenant. When they accepted him and they took the Passover lamb like they were supposed to because the Passover lamb represents Jesus. And Jesus bore our sicknesses and carried our diseases and by his stripes were healed. So healing and really what we call divine health, in other words, protection from sicknesses and diseases that would otherwise come upon us if we were out of God's will. God will not allow that to come upon us, so we have protection extended to us. But if we step out of his will and we get over into sickness and disease and we come back to him, now healing is made available to us through Jesus Christ. Otherwise, that word that said that through his, by his stripes we're healed means nothing, and God's not a liar. And so what happens is, is, again, putting yourself in a position of somebody in the northern kingdom who suffered such desolation they've they've you know they've got they're they're suffering terrible things and they're like we're just trying to make it one day they hear a message come celebrate the passover return to god so they pick everything up they humble themselves they travel and even though they're not ceremonially clean they're not in a position to where they should be able to take the passover they're able to take it anyway and then all of a sudden they're healed of some physical thing that they've had been carrying i mean it's amazing you know god's good Verse 21, so the people of Israel who were present in Jerusalem joy, joyously celebrated the festival of unleavened bread for seven days. Each day the Levites and priests sang to the Lord, accompanied by loud instruments. Well, yeah, everyone celebrated because God's healing them. God's, God's restoring them, you know, uh, restoring their fortunes. Verse 22, Hezekiah encouraged all the, the Levites regarding the skill they displayed as they served the Lord. The celebration continued for seven days. Peace offerings were sacrificed, and the people gave thanks to the Lord, the God of their ancestors. Now, notice that there is a there's a um, there is a reciprocation going on. There is a principle of reciprocation because the people came to celebrate the Passover, and they had not seen really any deliverance yet. But as they were faithful to start celebrating God, and as they were faithful to start uh, celebrating what God has done for them. It's sort of an act of faith because they haven't seen any, I mean, it is an act of faith. They haven't really seen deliverance yet. But then God begins to deliver them in the midst of their celebration. And so their celebration becomes louder. And that's the way it ought to be. So verse 23, the entire assembly then decided to continue the festival another seven days. So they celebrated joyfully for another week. They're having a revival. Verse 24, King Hezekiah gave the people 1,000 bulls and 7,000 sheep and goats for his offerings, and the officials donated 1,000 bulls and 10,000 sheep and goats. Meanwhile, many more priests purified themselves. The entire assembly of Judah rejoiced, including the priests, the Levites, all who came from the land of Israel, the foreigners who came to the festival. So there's even Gentiles getting in on this. The Bible says, God told them at the first Passover, if there's any strangers among you that want to celebrate the Passover, let them draw near. 
and then they can become Jews themselves. And so this is what was hap what's happening. We see uh, God blessing this. Verse 26, there was great joy in the city, for Jerusalem had not seen a celebration like this one since the days of Solomon, King David's son. Then the priests and Levites stood and blessed the people, and God heard their prayer from his holy dwelling in heaven. Chapter 31, when the festival ended, the Israelites who attended went to all the towns of Judah, Benjamin, Ephraim, and Manasseh, and they smashed. I, say, I said, should have said Israelites. When the festival ended, the Israelites who attended went. So these are the, the people from the north who came, who humbled themselves and came. Now they're going back to their, their, their homes. It says, uh, they went to all the towns of Judah, Benjamin, Ephraim, and Manasseh, and they smashed all the sacred pillars, cut down the Asherah poles, and removed the pagan shrines and altars. After this, the Israelites returned to their own towns and homes. So, uh, so first we saw they cleansed the temple and they, they cleansed it of all the idols and all the, all the nonsense that was going on there. Uh, and they opened the doors and opened everything up. And then, then uh, it extended to the people in, the, in Jerusalem and they, they purified all that junk out of Jerusalem itself. And then they have the Passover celebration where they invite people to come in and repent. And after those people have repented and celebrated God, they have now gone back out to the countryside and removed all the pagan shrines out of there. And so we see a progressive uh, purification of God's people and his land. And it's awesome to see. Verse 2, Hezekiah then organized the priests and Levites into divisions to offer the burnt offerings and peace offerings and to worship and give thanks and praise to the Lord at the gates of the temple. The king also made a personal contribution of animals for the daily morning and evening burnt offerings, the weekly Sabbath festivals, the monthly new moon festivals, and the annual festivals as prescribed in the law of the Lord. In addition, he required the people in Jerusalem to bring a portion of their goods to the priests and Levites so they could devote themselves fully to the law of the Lord. Why? Because they had to bring the tithes and offerings in order to um, uh, su supply the, the, the priests and Levites with their sustenance because their work was to minister to the Lord and it also was for the maintenance of the temple. Verse 5, when the people of Israel heard these requirements, they responded generously by bringing the first share of their grain, new wine, olive oil, honey, and all the produce of their fields. They brought a large quantity, a tithe of all they produced. The people who had moved to Judah from Israel and the people of Judah themselves brought in the tithes of their cattle, sheep, and goats, and a tithe of the things that had been dedicated to the Lord their God. And they piled them up in great heaps. They began piling them up in late spring, and the heaps continued to grow until early autumn. So that's why sometimes you see um, in churches where they'll take up an offering, and sometimes the people themselves will just decide to start giving. And we we call if they start piling it up on at the altar, we call that a heap offering. That's essentially what they're doing here. It's a it's they're they're piling it up in great heaps because they are generously giving of the increase that God's given them, and they're just doing it because they're they're just being generous. And so verse eight, when Hezekiah and his officials came and saw these huge piles. They thanked the Lord and his people Israel. Where did all this come from? Hezekiah asked the priests and Levites. And Azariah, the high priest from the family of Zadok, replied, Since the people began bringing their gifts to the Lord's temple, we have had enough to eat and plenty to spare. The Lord has blessed his people, and, this is left, and all this is left over. Hezekiah ordered that storerooms be prepared in the temple of the Lord. When this was done, the people faithfully brought all their the gifts, tithes, and other items dedicated for the use in the temple. Conaniah the Levite was put in charge, assisted by his brother Shimei. The supervisors under them were Jehiel, Azaziah, Nahath, Asahel, Jeremoth, Josabad, Eliel, um, Ismachiah, Mahath, and, ben and Beniah. These appointments were made by King Hezekiah and Azariah, the chief official in the temple of God. Koreh, son of Imna the Levite, who was the gatekeeper at the east gate, was put in charge of distributing the voluntary offerings given to God, the gifts and the things that had been dedicated to the Lord. His faithful assistants were Eden, Maniamin, Jeshua, Shemaiah, Amariah, and Shechaniah. They distributed the gifts among the families of priests in their towns by their divisions, dividing the gifts fairly among the old and young alike. So now they're given back. They distributed the gifts to all males three years old and older, regardless of their place in the genealogical records. The distribution went to all who would come to the Lord's temple to perform their daily duties according to the divi their divisions, because there's a lot of Levites, and so that's, that's to the family of the Levites. They're making it possible for them to serve by giving them the material things that they need. Then, uh, that, that, and that's the case, they, 
they don't have to attend to their own fields and their own flocks. Um, they can leave that to the younger ones who are not old enough to serve as, as uh, temple assistants. And because they've now received an increase to their household, they can come and they can serve the Lord. That was the purpose of it. That was uh, why God instituted that. So verse 17, they distributed gifts to the priests who were listed by their families in the genealogical records and to the Levites, 20 years old or older, who were listed according to their jobs and their divisions. Food allotments were also given to the families of all those listed in the genealogical records, including their little babies, wives, sons, and daughters, for they had been they had all been faithful in purifying themselves. As for the priests, the descendants of Aaron, who were living in the open villages around the towns, men were appointed by name to distribute portions to every male among the priests and to all the Levites listed in the genealogical records. Remember, the Levites and the priests were tied because it's, it's uh, the priests were of the line of Aaron, but Aaron was a part of the tribe of Levi. So that's a so you have that innermost layer of Aaron's family, and then an outer layer of the of the Levites, the temple assistants. In this way, King Hezekiah handled the distribution throughout all Judah, doing what was pleasing and good in the sight of the Lord as God. In all that he did in the service of the temple of God and in his efforts to follow God's laws and commands, Hezekiah sought his God wholeheartedly. As a result, he was very successful. See, he could have just taken all those that leftover stuff and put it into his own palace, but he didn't do it. He distributed it where it was supposed to go. And so um, it's awesome. And keep in mind, too, that they're still coming out of a time of great... Um, trouble and trial in the land. And so all these gifts that the people are giving, they're giving out of their lack. It's like uh, Jesus talked about the when he was watching the people bringing gifts to the to the temple and the many rich people came and gave a lot of stuff and that, that widow came and she just put in two small coins and he said she has given more than any of these others because she has given out of her lack but they have given out of their surplus. Well, this is a time in their history when everybody was in lack because the, the previous wicked king had done so many evil things that God humbled the nation by taking away a lot of their stuff. There, some, a lot of their people were displaced. They, were just, they lost their army. They're in ruins. And so despite that, they are now giving generously out of their lack. And now God, we see the beginning of him distributing back and blessing the people. It starts with the Levites who are in direct service to God, but you're going to see it extend further into their harvest because God uh, blesses those who sow, and they have sowed. And so this is an awesome thing to see. So let's go ahead and, and pray, and uh, we'll conclude this episode. Father, I thank you for uh, your goodness and mercy. I thank you for your generosity, God. We cannot give out, out give you. And so, Father, um, show us where to sow. Show us where to uh, uh, to provide for those in need, Lord God. We we have we may be in a time of lack. We may be in a season where many many of us don't have as much as we normally would have. But show us where to sow. Uh, show us how to sow, Lord God, whether it's an increase or whether it's in time, whatever it is, Father God, show us what to do, how to do it, um, so that our households can be uh, blessed and prosperous, and then we can give even more, because the word says that he who gives to the poor lends to the Lord. And so uh, show us what to do and how to do it. Give us a joyous heart as we give. I thank you for these things, and in Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Well, bless you guys, and we will see you again.